Um, now, uh, let's uh, get, get kick off their investor panel. Uh, we are we have about 30 minutes and uh, probably best if I start by introducing myself. As uh, Bob uh, Gillespie mentioned, we work together, um, rich scale-up program uh, fu fully owned by Second Century Ventures with only difference, Bob sits in Chicago and I'm in London. Um, that is an amazing panel because I believe all of us are dialing in today from different locations. Um, the only thing which probably um, uh, we have all in common is uh, the stage of investments. We all, all look seed series A, uh, largely the, those are the investment targets. And um, I'm sure that all of us have very different perspectives, so it's going to be interesting. Um, we, we've got six uh, people who are extremely high caliber. I'll, um, let's uh, probably the best way of doing that if I direct the conversation and initially uh, I'll be picking questions and picking people who um, I feel probably best suited to uh, kick off uh, answering. But uh, please, 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 uh, some of you who have uh, more insight to add and um, elaborate on questions, topics, uh, feel free to jump in. And uh, uh, one more uh, question or request to the audience, especially to startups that we have um, uh, here today attending. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to submit them onto their uh, Zoom group chat. I will see them uh, and I will try to pick up um, the, uh, a few and get them um, answered by the panel today. Again, we are very short on time though, uh, so let's, uh, let's kick it off. Um, well, uh, first, uh, first thing first, we are in the environment of COVID and uh, there are a lot of uh, changes that come uh, with, with, with that uh, phenomenon. So um, I would like to uh, start by um, exploring how venture funds are sourcing deals these days. So uh, we used to benefit from face-to-face -face meetings, a lot of many events. Uh, those speech battles being uh, physical uh, events. Uh, now we, of course, have Zoom, but as we saw today, technology can let us down sometimes. Um, so tell us uh, a little, like, tell, tell us more about what uh, sources of um, deals you find uh, most useful these days. We, of course, have a lot of time uh, to be spent in front of the screen, so we can take the benefit of this extra time without commuting or traveling. Um, is that indeed, indeed um, that beneficial? So I'll probably uh, let um, Thomas and Clara to kick off um, and you know, giving us some uh, insights into their daily jobs and sourcing activities. So Thomas, would you like to start? Yes, sure, sure. I mean, uh, um, nice to meet you all. Thanks again for the invitation. So it's true that the COVID uh, uh, affected us uh, a lot. I mean, uh, at Plug and Play, we were used to organize 2,000 events per annum, uh, physical events. And so we totally switched our model and started organizing a lot of uh, webinars and so forth. But this was mainly to actually engage our community rather than to meet new people. So we actually needed to find a new way how to source new deals. And we used uh, more and more uh, internet and leverage our contacts rather than going to uh, physical internal of, or external events, which uh, actually we are not really used to do um, in the past. But this uh, actually worked pretty well. I mean, again, plug and play, we are sourcing deals not only for a pure VC uh, investments, but we are also sourcing startups that could solve the pain points of our corporate partners. So we work with large corporations that get specific needs, innovation needs, and then we need to source the right startups that could help them. And it's true that these needs actually change a lot during the COVID um, because a lot of large corporations never thought about these new hygiene measures and so forth. So we needed to come up really fast with new solutions that could support them. And to do so, uh, we mainly use the internet and the, the, the news. Um, we leverage a lot on uh, uh, other uh, VC funds, incubator, accelerators. So we actually realized that, um, of course, it's always better to, to, to uh, a network with people in person. However, uh, it can go really fast online as well, and you can leverage even more people. So this is what we have done during the 
confinement time, let's say. Yeah, uh, fair enough. Uh, Clara, how do you deal with that at Balderton? Yeah, I think it was uh, very tough at the beginning, um, especially kind of the, the panic moment where everyone kind of looked at their portfolio and, and was focusing on that at the beginning. Um, and I think startups themselves have had to kind of look at where they're at um, their runway and kind of decide whether they, if they were thinking of fundraising, um, whether they should kind of wait a little bit to see how things kind of, how the dust settles. So um, I think the first reaction was kind of a, uh, uh, interesting in terms of, you know, people looking at the portfolios, startups kind of waiting to see what's happening. Uh, and then in May, June, I would say that um, we've seen quite a lot of startups uh, fundraising and, uh, but most of them were from pre-existing relationships, at least for us. Um, so we have signed term sheets, et cetera, but most of them were from, uh, or at least someone in the team, one of the partners had, had met the team or the founders before. Um, and now what we're seeing is that I think investors are adapting uh, a little bit more so we've uh, tried to do things more online obviously you can take more calls um, because you can do zoom calls and get them in a row and you don't have the traveling involved but I do feel like sometimes it becomes a bit too transactional and I think um, in the future we need to find better ways to kind of build relationships and understand like having that connection without necessarily meeting face to face especially when uh, we cover kind of the whole of Europe and, uh, you know, if you're in London and you're meeting uh, entrepreneurs in different countries, that's not something that's going to be able, that's going to change anytime soon. Um, so I think it is changing and more recently actually signed uh, term sheets remotely. So no one in the team had met the founder before uh, or the team face to face before. So I think things are changing, but it is taking a little bit of time for uh, people to adjust, especially investors to adjust their way of uh, working. Um, and then in terms of industries, we've seen mostly industries around uh, that have been accelerated uh, with COVID uh, and investors are kind of uh, looking into these spaces. So obviously digital health, and then you have all the working from home areas. Uh, so remote tools, working tools, uh, home workouts, et cetera, which are um, super exciting. And then actually in terms of sustainability, uh, there's been a lot of momentum uh, this year. And we've seen, I think it's um, for the first half of 2020, uh, the uh, net inflows into GSG funds is the same as the whole of 2019, uh, which is crazy. So there's definitely a lot happening in that space as well. Um, and I think startups in that space are going to uh, see a lot of investments coming that way. Yeah, that's encouraging. I'm encouraging to hear that you've been making investments into new companies um, recently. So uh, on that, Clary, uh, and probably Bob as well, if you uh, could uh, shed some light on what, what sort of uh, characteristics should um, startups have to um, get them through fundraising if you've never seen them before. So what has changed and basically what kind of deals are getting done? Is it stage dependent or uh, is it indeed relationship and referrals? Uh, what sort of um, uh, what, what were those deals basically that you, you signed up uh, you signed uh, recently? Yeah, so so as I said, um, the, some of them were pre-existing relationships uh, and startups. So we mostly invest in Series A, but we often talk to startups at a much earlier stage. So we've been following them, following them since seed stage, um, and so they're getting to a point where we feel comfortable. Uh, and excited to be part of that journey. Um, so I would say it's for now, we're still kind of uh, looking at how to improve uh, the new way of working within investors and, and founders and new startups that we're looking at. Um, in terms of areas, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, kind of the, the, the industries that have been accelerated with COVID are super interesting. And I think the reason why they're interesting is because um, the pace of innovation is very high and it's, we see a lot of new startups and what they're doing is very interesting. So I think it's a space to spaces to watch um, and, and we'll see which one turns into investments. In terms of stages, maybe just, a, a, I guess a little point is we're bound around, I think late stage has been mostly impacted because of the uh, valuations being so tight, uh, tightly closed um, related to the public markets. In terms of earlier stages, um, I think it, it kind of depends if it's a seed and series A, if the team is good and they have good numbers, I don't think that their valuations have been impacted that much, but it's definitely a tougher environment to raise. Fair enough. No, I want to comment on that because we are actually seeing something different here. I mean, obviously we're a US based firm, but we invest globally and I've seen late stage stuff go absolutely crazy. I mean, some firms, we've, we've done deals that are 
that are Zoom only, but you know, companies in our own portfolio have raised very successful fundings in late stage uh, with entrepreneurs going out and basically speaking purely over Zoom. Uh, I think Masterclass is a great example of that. Phenomenal firm, a lot of interest. Uh, you've also seen other players in the United States like Co2 deploying stunning amounts of cash. You know, the U.S. public markets seem to be totally disconnected from the economy. There's literally no correlation at all, uh, except for the fact that the U.S. government is flooding an unlimited amount of money and support into the market to make sure it stays healthy. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting time right now, but I'm seeing it up and down the stack. We're seeing very early get done and very late get done, and we're seeing them get priced at prices that make our prior beliefs in what were too expensive look silly. Uh, whether that'll last or not is uncertain, but it's a pretty amazing time. Yeah, interesting. I share this view. Um, Bob, um, you just um, announced, uh, you announced a new clause into which commercial um, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, tell us, uh, uh, give us some insight into the diligence process. So what, what, were, what were the metrics and what, did that change much uh, that uh, make a success for, for, from your perspective for, 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 the, for the company to invest into? Sure. Yeah, we, uh, we were timed great on this. So uh, if you figure that the, you know, the, the pandemic really hit the U.S. pretty hard, you know, starting in maybe early March, um, we were making all of our, we sourced all year long, but then in January, February, we start making offers and then we're negotiating in, in April and May. So it was right in the middle of the, you know, the, the real big problem that uh, we continue to fight here for reasons that, you know, we could discuss. Uh, but um, we uh, basically what, what happened there is that we had, um, the short answer is we didn't really change our metrics very much. We, we took a longer term view uh, I'm, I was kind of in the opinion that a good business is a good business. Um, COVID hopefully is a, a relatively, you know, we're going to see the end of it, right? And if you're running a venture firm, you're, you're looking at a, you know, five to seven to 10 year time horizon. Um, so we, I at least didn't really back off of the metrics that we look at. You know, we're, we're typically looking for companies that are, you know, uh, we, we go from free revenue, but really our sweet spot is kind of companies that are, are moving towards a million in ARR. Uh, you know, we, we stuck pretty well with that. I would say that the, the big thing that we had happen in COVID and, and I guess my message for those that are, are trying to learn from this panel would be um, deals haven't really stopped or slowed down. At least from what I've seen, there's been a lot of activity. Uh, we've continued to be very active. We're, we're making four more investments this month um, on our fund. And, uh, you know, I would say the one thing that we did slow down on is we have a couple of companies in our portfolio that, um, you know, that were highly affected. We have others that could pivot and, and, and effectively pivoted or added on a virtual component or weren't some were even accelerated by, by COVID. Um, but really we kind of, we kind of stuck to our knitting a little bit um, and kind of doubled down on our process and our metrics. We, we uh, didn't really look later. We looked for quality companies that we thought that we could really assist. Um, and, you know, a company like The Mint, which is one of our portfolio companies that, that does like high-end apartment cleaning in multifamily housing, obviously they were very much affected because you couldn't get into people's homes to clean, but, you know, their trajectory was really, you know, had been very rapid prior to that. So they raised a little money to hunker down and get through this and now they're, you know, they're back. Um, but those you got to be a little more careful with that are directly affected by the virus, but uh, I'll just, I'll end by saying, you know, we kind of doubled down on our thesis. We didn't really let this affect us that much. And we've had to adjust like everybody has, but uh, kind of stick to our guns. We, it's a long-term play. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, Lewis, Gary, uh, you haven't spoken yet. So let me uh, ask you as well. Uh, what um, did you uh, incorporate the longer term uh, effects of COVID into your investment decision-making? You speaking to me, Valentina? Gary, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, absolutely. But you know, I'm doing one to three panels per day. Um, I just did Burning Man prior to this, so we're extremely active. I mean, you got to use the medium. Look, look, we're as I said, uh, Zoom six months ago had 30 million daily active users. Today they've got 300 million. So. The, the thing that we're looking at is we're looking at artificial intelligence across the board. I don't care if it's in Dubai. 
I don't care it's in Moscow, Kiev, it doesn't matter. We're looking for incredible companies. At the same time, the fundamentals haven't changed. We're looking for companies that have gone through, we say startup 3.0, 1.0's acceleration with a Saeed and plug and play, but who I know by the way, Thomas. Uh, two is uh, regional domination where you've really creamed your regional market. But then the third part, which is a missing link. And that's where we come in with our venture studio, which is take the company global. We use Silicon Valley as a port to the rest of the world. I've done 15 companies, right? Had one unicorn. I was on the original management team of Click Software, which was sold to Salesforce. So we have, um, we say intergenerational teams. So we got the uh, young folks. So we got the seasoned veterans, people like the former COO of Walmart, the former chief security officer of Apple, and people that are world renowned. What I see happening is that this is as Ben was saying, you know, this is like when, when I did my e-commerce company, Ben, I remember Fashion Mall, by the way. I work with Broad Vision, if you remember Broad Vision. Sure. So I actually started Broadly at one of the first e-commerce consulting companies. So this is like, this is bigger than that because our lives have changed. Think about it. We were on Zoom a year ago if I said, hey, listen, Valentina, let's do a Zoom call. I don't know. Maybe we should meet in London when you're there. Thomas would be saying, well, I don't know. Meet with Saeed out in California or I'll be out in California. You know, it's changed. Our lives have changed. And the companies that adapt to this, this is the new reality for the next year and a half to two years. And if you don't adapt, you die. And if you don't get into artificial intelligence, neural nets, ML, the companies aren't going to succeed. So we're looking at resilient teams that have revenue, that have the, an open mindset, that really truly want to go global. And as I said, we have a $100 million fund we're building in Atlanta today. I built a $10 million seed fund, and I also have a private fund with uh, two billionaire friends of mine that I lead that we use our private money. So we're active and I love it because this is a great time because you have people, what is it? Um, you have people that are afraid that aren't investing and they got people like us. And somebody yesterday said that I'm a unicorn hunter. I am, I admit it. <laughs> I love unicorns. So, and what I would like to do is partner with other folks on this panel that want them the same way that we do. They're passionate. We know our company's called GSD uh, Venture Studios and I named it GSD for a reason. It came from the back of Zuckerberg's office, get shit done. And that's what it's all about. Very good. Very good. Uh, Lewis, how are things in Spain? Uh, how do you uh, see your investment thesis? Is it changing or just like there is? It's still long, long term, um, remains unchanged? Uh, I, I think that for us is a good opportunity, especially because we are in, a, in a, a little city and now the people don't want to live in the big cities. And uh, the companies want to be uh, multi multinational, multicultural, and I, I don't care where the companies are located, where are the, the talent are located. Then in the past, you need to be in, in London, you need to be in Madrid, you need to be in Barcelona, but now it's different. You can uh, create your company in a city like La Rioja, Logroño, it's a little city. And from here, you can uh, go away with your product, with your company to every, everywhere in the world. Uh, uh, currently, we have invested in a company that want to be the unicorn of the freestyle rap. They make a competition with freestyles. And it doesn't matter if the company is here in a little city because they, they are, have customers over the world. Uh, then uh, the reality have changed, dramatical change. And I think that for the, the places like us, the La Rioja in the north of Spain, it's a good opportunity because uh, they prefer, the people, the talent prefer to live in a, in a little city because the, the COVID in, a, in the, these places are less important and you have, the risks are, are minimum that you live in a, in a big city. Uh, especially with, during the, the confinement, uh, you can go out to, for a walk uh, uh, during your, your, your work. And if you live in Madrid or in a big cities, you have to stay at home. It's uh, bad for your health, but bad for your brain. Then I think the, the new reality is good for the little places like, like us. 
Yep. <clears throat> Interesting, right. Uh, we touched upon briefly um, the sustainability element, and Clara is absolutely right. The trend um, has been only accelerating uh, for the sustainable investing uh, in 2020, and um, I, I feel that COVID, if anything, has only accelerated that uh, already existing trend. Kristen, I gather that you have a strong background in sustainability and sustainable investing. Uh, what do you see uh, in terms of investment, investor appetite uh, for sustainable solutions and uh, you know, interesting startups coming uh, into play? Um, and what's your fund strategy in that, in, that, in that sense? Yeah, so even before COVID kind of hit, there was starting to become like a bloom of the trend for sustainability, right? So you started seeing that through like Breakthrough, you started seeing that come in with the Carlisle Group, with Amazon. Um, and so it's not really a secret that sustainability has kind of been on the edge of everything. Um, so I also have my own sustainable investment thesis as well as my funds, right? So my fund invests agnostically into all companies, not necessarily strictly along the lines of clean tech, green tech, which is typically what sustainability is looked at. Sustainability in another sense of how I look at it and how I also invest is sustainable operations. So it has like that two tiers, right? Like the one way of you looking at sustainability in a very like environmental awareness aspect. And then the other aspect of sustainability is just, is your company going to survive tomorrow? Um, and in a down market and in a recession and everything that COVID kind of portrays, that's the reason why both things are so important. Um, not just the environmental awareness and the aspect of knowing how your supply chain and how your, you know, company is going to be affected by the immediate events in the world, but also just do you have, you know, the key things that we look at during DD in order to make sure that we're surviving. So just like everyone else, it sounds like you're on the panel, like we're, there's no stopping of sustainable investment and it's just been growing excessively. Um, and really even to a lot of folks who in the past, there was a little bit of a nuance or an interpretation that sustainability was not lucrative. Um, it's actually really more so important and necessary for a company to survive. Um, and so now that we see that, especially in COVID, I feel like that's a really great example, right? Is you can't change what the world around you is going to be. Um, you can't actually control every little thing um, that happens in your universe. So do you have the stickiness? Do you have the grit? Do you have all the traction that's gonna actually allow you to move forward? Um, and is that gonna be supportive of you? Um, and so that's really the bigger trend that I've been seeing. Um, even in my past and before really kind of getting into the investment sphere, my background is actually in sustainability. And so when it comes to doubling down on sustainability, because it is um, typically a more higher capital expenditure industry, um, you need those partnerships, you need those, all those relationships. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's going to be a team effort. And that's really what even I look at when I see companies is it's not necessarily going to be like, how great is your product? How, you know, how smart are you? Because it's engineer after engineer after engineer, and they're all wicked smart. But do you have the partnerships? And that's the biggest failure and the biggest obstacle to moving forward. So if there was any one takeaway to just like any of the other folks on the line, um, it's really when you're looking at a company and trying to understand if they're actually going to penetrate the single market, it's what relationships do they have? Because when you have such a high capex industry, there's just no way to move forward if you don't have support for your bandwidth. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point on support and partnerships. And in fact, uh, all of us, uh, we have, um, for our portfolio companies, we do provide support as uh, venture funds and that's our, our vested interest. Uh, so let me ask uh, Thomas, Bob, Ben, you obviously man are managing large portfolios. Uh, what support did you provide to your companies during these challenging times? Uh, Thomas, let's start with you. Yes, I mean, uh, we've been in the business of supporting startups since roughly 25 years. Uh, not only the, the, our portfolio startups, but even the startups we are accelerating uh, because there is no real correlation between the startups we invest and the startups we accelerate. But uh, yeah, in our portfolio right now, we have more than a thousand startups. And it's true that during the COVID time, so at the beginning, uh, we decided to totally freeze our uh, uh, investment pipeline and to focus exclusively on portfolio management. So we, uh, all of us got 
uh, define some startups we wanted to support and we basically uh, define a clear strategy, action plans. Um, we uh, sit also with the other investors to try to see how we could best support our portfolio companies. And surprisingly, uh, our startups did pretty well. So as we mentioned before, some pivoted um, to new business models, some just created an additional business model during the crisis, and some became even stronger with their existing business models. But we've been able to support our startups pretty well, thanks to also our uh, ecosystem of 400 corporate partners. I mean, definitely it, it, it helps. But also with all of the events we have been organized, it, it, it has been a bit easier for us to promote the technologies of, uh, of our portfolio startups, definitely. I mean, we even had uh, one uh, startup that became a unicorn, uh, one of our portfolio startups, a board in the edtech sector that became a unicorn during the, the COVID. So I think in all the crises, you have opportunities and we have done our best to support our portfolio startups to, to, to strive and to uh, become uh, even more successful during, during this crisis and this tough time. Bob, ben, ben feel free to jump in uh, at anything sure. more. You know, I think like most firms, when COVID hit, and, and we got there a little bit ahead of time, um, I think we started even as early as February this year with our own team, sort of first you protect your team, then you immediately go to your portfolio. And so an enormous amount of time was spent on that. Everybody went to their different, you know, we've got a, a wide array of folks. We've got close to 500 live portfolio companies. And so you, you spend time with the founders trying to understand if they're safe, you know, what realities they need to deal with. I'll give you an example. I can speak through the lens of my own eyes the best, but you know, as an entrepreneur for 25 years, I lived through a lot of downtimes. I started a company on a college on Black Monday, which was the single largest drop in the Dow in any day. I was driving to a trade show for my first go-to-market opportunity, and I thought, and I heard it on the news, and I thought, well, I guess I don't need to bother. I should just give up now. I mean, <laughs> the market's tanking. But what you discover is that in difficult times, silver linings appear, and people have a lot of needs. You know, particularly right now, people need to spend less money and they need to bring more money in. And if you can help with either of those, that's great. Communication vehicles has been talked about. You know, Gary mentioned the sort of lift for Zoom. So interestingly, we spent a lot of time with our companies trying to help them think through how to be safe, to make sure they're well-funded, to, to think about whether they have to resize the company at all. Pre-COVID, uh, entrepreneurs in general, and I, I think this has been a challenge for a long time, money has been easier for the very best entrepreneurs to come by than probably at any time in human history. And because of that, they've been able to raise more money than they might have otherwise raised or even needed. And money is like time. Things expand to fill it. If you book an hour meeting, the meeting takes an hour. You don't get to finish it up in 20 minutes. If you raise $100 million, you need to spend the $100 million. And so people would often get ahead of themselves. And so in some ways, what COVID did was force companies to make the hard decisions they probably should have been rigorously making all the way along. Now, since then, I've noticed that by and large, companies have done far better, and I'm knocking on wood for this, than I've expected. Some of them because they got a quote unquote COVID bump, others because things didn't get as bad as people expected. Now, some of those are because globally, the, the economy is being supported in a lot of different ways. But, you know, we've got a very large network of people to help in a lot of different areas and that includes everything from helping with hiring right now interestingly enough for the people that want to hire there is a wealth of extremely high quality people available on the market in a way that you know our head of talent said she has never seen before um, but you know the, the number one thing you can do for an entrepreneur is to be there for them to help both with you know it's not my job to tell people what to do it is however my job i believe to share the experiences i've lived through if those can be helpful to give entrepreneurs a way to think about a challenge so, you know, I want to be a counsel, but it's not my job to be prescriptive. Certainly, I'd like to continuously focus on the things I think are important and make sure those are being paid attention to. But at the end of the day, you cannot say, go do this. We're minority investors, right? We take board seats. But minority investors control nothing at the end of the day. They have influence. They have influence through relationships, through trust, through the credibility of what they bring to the table. Uh, and, and I will say I have been really pleased with my own portfolio with the, the way the entrepreneurs have been able to navigate uh, and, and just do make the hard choices, but also accelerate into the opportunity. So it's a better time than I expected it to be right now, I'll tell you that. We'll see what the second wall of the storm looks like when 
when fall comes. Indeed. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, um, Bob, uh, I'm going to add, uh, and then we are quickly running out of time, so it's probably time to wrap up as well. So to, the, to this same question, how you supported companies uh, in your portfolio during that time, I would like to also add additional question, which I'm going to ask everyone in the panel. Uh, if you were to give one adv advice to the founders now, based on the, on the experience that you, 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 you've been through and uh, the learning outcomes that you've uh, gained for yourselves during COVID and the crisis, what this advice would be? And that's for the founders who are listening to us now, uh, for, for, the, for the startups that, we are, uh, that are going to present uh, in those breakout rooms in uh, two minutes. Bob, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, we're, we're a little, uh, we're specialized, I guess. Like I said, we're prop tech and because we, we our, our, uh, our global organization is the National Association of Realtors. We have 1.4 million members that are realtors and real estate professionals. So one of the things that we're allowed to do uh, we're able to do is to really promote our, our companies that Second Century Ventures and Reach have invested in uh, to our membership. So one of the things that we did in COVID is uh, we had sort of a two-sided market, if you think about it, where we had our, our companies that had issues, but we also had now our Walmart members. wants to buy TikTok. Oh, sorry. Uh, so um, what was I saying? Oh, so we have our membership as well, our real estate agents that, uh, that had, you know, COVID impact as well. So one thing that we did is we rolled out a, uh, we called it Right Tools Right Now program. And really what that allowed us to do is take the offerings that our, uh, our portfolio companies had that were directly targeted at our real estate agents who now had problems because of COVID to, you know, work virtually, have workflow tools, better marketing tools, whatever it might be. And we went directly to our portfolio companies and said, hey, you know, what kind of offers, what kind of uh, things can we make our membership aware of that can affect the day-to-day -day business in the new normal of COVID? So that was one of the big initiatives that we undertook was Right Tools Right Now. Um, I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll, and, I, and then everything else that the two gentlemen before me said is completely, that we did all that stuff too. It's, it's you know, make sure that you're healthy, make sure your companies are healthy. Um, so those are all very good points. Uh, I'll go first, Valentina, on, you know, kind of my advice to startups. Um, in general, my uh, advice to startups, I, I would say this COVID, non-COVID, um, when raising money, make sure you're targeting the right investor. Uh, I get bothered all the time, not bothered. I get reached out to all the time with, you know, hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a, a social media platform. I, I don't do that. You just wasted your time. Uh, you know, I'm a, a biotech startup. That's fantastic. Go find a bio, go, go find a biotech guy. And if you're a prop tech guy, I'm all over it. Want to see it, want to learn it, can connect you. So just like you need to be hyper-focused on your uh, customer and know your customer and know your target and go after that, uh, go after your investor in the same way. Find out who invests in your field, find out who invests in your vertical. Uh, one of the people on here said that they're, um, might have been Clara, said that they, uh, they're agnostic. Uh, so great, talk to, if you're a prop tech, talk to Clara, talk to me. If you're, uh, if you're biotech, talk to Clara, don't talk to me, for an example. Um, know your target investor so you aren't wasting your time with people who will never write you a check because that's just not what they do. So stage, vertical, uh, check size, geography, understand what they invest in and then um, connect with the, the, the right group of investors. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Gary, um, what piece of advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, this is like, you know, we call it the keep it simple, stupid rule, KISS. You know, so revenue matters. If you ask all the VCs on the panel, revenue matters. So make sure that you have the right kind of revenue. Make sure you go down through and you, your team makes sense to the investors. Now, you know, from my standpoint, we have Delaware corporations with offices in Silicon Valley. Why? Because there's so much capital there and so much opportunity to get kind of the right kind of valuation. Um, be prudent with the money that you spend. Always be prudent with the money you spend. You know, and every time I tell the the startups to look at it as it's your money. And I don't mean squander it. I mean to be able to covet it because you're going to need that. So the rules um, haven't changed, right? Things are the same. It's just you need to make sure that you apply them. Yeah, thanks for the acronym, Gary. Uh, we've got a thank you on the chat as well. Um, uh, Luis? Um, for, for me, uh, my uh, advice is to the entrepreneurs is more than ever to take care of, of customers, to take care of uh, providers, 
your team and of course the cast. More than ever, you have to be to, to listen your, your providers, your customers, because they have the same problems that you. The, the, your customers and your provider have to feel that you are close to them because now everybody has problems. You have to feel in the long term, not try to make a business now just because your providers or your team are in a bad position. Feel that the, 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 the time come back is again. And, and of course, take care of the cash because if you don't have cash, you, you have to close your company. The cash is your blood. Then, uh, of course, uh, as Gary said before, especially when the cash is from the investors, you have to take after, of course, your investors because if you have a problem in a mid term or in a short term, if you are close to them, they can help you too. But if the investor feel that you are uh, doing bad with their money, they go away from you soon. Thank you, Luz. Clara? Uh, I think on my side, uh, I would say it's the word hyper-focus. So I was going to say focus, but then uh, Bob said hyper-focus, which I think is even better. But basically the idea that whether your um, startup is being accelerated with COVID or your startup is actually unfortunately in one of the areas that has been kind of slowing down or, uh, or having a bit more of a time. Um, I think it's a great moment to focus really on your core focus on, uh, you know, what you need to do and what you, when you know how to do best um, and hopefully get out of it um, stronger. Thank you. Kristen? Yeah, um, I think that everyone's made some really great points so far. Kind of bouncing off the back of like hyper focusing. Part of hyper focusing and the reason why it's so important is because as an entrepreneur, we're naturally we're naturally opportunists, right? Um, and so as opportunists, you always think that there are so many things that you could do or so many options and or pivots your company can make. Um, as those are fine. It's more so the fact that know your customer, know what your business is actually doing. Bringing in revenue is kind of something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, especially at an early stage, they keep pushing off because they're like, no, we still have to um, really, really finish out this MVP or really make sure that we feel like this pilot and, you know, settled, especially when it comes to sustainability, when there is so many, there's so much R&D that comes into it. Um, at the end of the day, I think revenue is so understated. And so when it comes to that point, it's make sure that you really know how you're actually going to sell your product and that people are buying it. Um, and that's the most important thing at the end of the day. Thanks, Kristen. Thomas? Yeah, I mean, um, as you just said, I think we, we, we've uh, said most of it, but uh, I think from what I've seen uh, uh, over the past few years, uh, when startups are raising funds, or generally speaking, when they just want to grow, uh, I think the problem is a lot of them are not uh, current coherent enough and not uh, professional enough when they are talking to investors or their, or their customers simply because they didn't uh, uh, do properly their homework before. So they, didn't, they, they, they were not really prepared. And when you arrive to a, a, a VC fund or your customers and you don't really know what you are um, basically talking about, or you did not prepare the right document or you did not, uh, you know, tailor your pitch, you are actually burning your, wing, your wings in a way and you know, opportunities, they, of course they come and you will have a, a additional ones in the future, but I think always come the best prepared in order not to lose a lot of opportunities. And from what I've seen over the past few years, I think this one, a terrible problem. Uh, most of the startups we receive like financial forecasts, they have like mistakes in it, for example, you know. Uh, most of them, they don't even have a data room prepared. You know, all, all of these minor details I think makes a lot of difference. And when you see actually a, a startup that is totally prepared, you kind of trust them even more, generally speaking. Yeah, I agree. I cannot agree more, Thomas. Ben, anything to add uh, from to, to finish off there, our, our panel? Sure, sure. I mean, you could literally spend the entire hour on the things I've learned around what, what would be useful for entrepreneurs to know. I'm going to boil it down to three things. Tenacity, careful choice, run your business. Tenacity is the, the true secret to entrepreneurial success. As somebody said earlier, everybody you get to see is wicked smart. 
right? I don't care where you came from. I don't care about your background. I don't care about your gender. I don't care about your race. I don't care about anybody. Intelligence, drive, tenacity. That's what makes for successful entrepreneurs. You gotta have a great idea. You gotta have a huge market. But those are the things that matter. So understand that your willingness to fight through is critical. Entrepreneurship is, if you are not a first responder, the hardest job in the world. You wake up every morning and people hit you in the face with a sledgehammer over and over again. You spend a year pitching something and the day before you want to get it closed, somebody gets fired, somebody dies. It happens. All those things have happened. It's a very hard business to be in. Own that. You're going to have to fight through a lot. So tenacity, number one. Second, careful choice. Be very careful who you choose to fund you. Now, I know many of you will say, well, I just want money, period. Like I can't get any. Well, how can I be careful? You've got to match your needs for success with the investor's need for success. I need uncapped upside. I need multi-billion dollar public companies. If you're gonna be happy with a $100 million outcome, you should never talk to me. And you should never talk to any venture capitalist in my opinion, because ultimately you will be in conflict with their desires unless they're a very small fund. And you want to be aligned because otherwise you can end up with some blockage. Lastly, run your company. The best rounds in the world are fuel on the fire rounds. You're already succeeding. Don't sort of go into it thinking, well, if I had all this money, I could do this. Do it. Do what you can do with the time and the creativity and the energy that you have. Because once you've proven you can do it, and once you're doing it exceptionally well, everybody will want to fund it. Fuel on the fire is what every VC wants to provide. They want to give money to companies that are already succeeding. And often I think there is a misunderstanding that it's like, oh, I have this great idea and if I had this money. Good to know. Now show me that great idea can turn into something. They're, they're, every once in a while, look, I've been doing this for 12 years. I've funded about 83 companies. In one instance that I can recall, did I fund purely, oh my God, that's the best idea in the world. We've got to get all the money around it. In many cases, I did fund PowerPoint slides with very well thought out and developed ideas. But you know, it's as a seed investor, just the farther along you go, the more you've got to be proving it. So understand tenacity is your friend and you're going to have to have it. And by the way, if you don't have it, you're not going to get it because if you're going to be willing to give up, you're going to give up, give up now and get out. Be careful who you choose to go along this ride with you because they've got to have the same interest to you and just fundamentally put all your energy into running your company and making it the best it can possibly be. And if that's a good fit for financing, that's what will happen. Thanks, Ben. Fantastic. And those are great insights and probably a very good way to finish off the panel. Uh, thanks, Eliana, for giving us an opportunity to, make, to, give, to, 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 to have this uh, wonderful discussion. Uh, probably time to move to the pitches. And apologies, we'll um, overrun a little bit, but hopefully that was for a good reason. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you for joining this panel. What we are doing now is we are splitting you into uh, separate rooms with startups which you voted for. You will not have moderation in this room, so startups will be waiting there for you. Startups, please be ready to upload your presentation. Now I will uh, announce uh, who, will, uh, who will, who is winning. So the first company is Jail Brain. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you will be invited to the room. The second company is Ripple. Also, thank you very much. You will, uh, you will be invited into the room with investors. Third company is Search Smartly. Thank you very much. Fourth company is Shield IoT. Uh, uh, first, uh, 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 the last company is Pohudvat or uh, Vetar. Uh, those are companies that will be invited to the rooms. I know that many investors voted for Urbanico project. Unfortunately, the founder cannot make it today, so we will introduce you personally. Also, some investors voted for several projects. Now we uh, will split you randomly into the rooms with the first of your vote, uh, voting project. And then if you want to switch the room, you just push ask for help and ask me to move you to the other room with the other project. So now I'm opening the rooms, just wait for one second. And there was one project we bus, we bus Gelat. There was one investor interested, so we will we will just do the room for you as well for two of you, so that you can have a chat. Okay, uh, I'm opening the rooms. Just wait, and you will be in your rooms. In case you need any assistance, just push the button, ask for help. This is a new format for us for us too. So I'm very sorry for any inconvenience in advance. 
please be <laughs> generous and um, let us uh, let us try to manage it and just in case you have any questions again ask me thank you Louis, which project do you want to talk to? Yes, I want to talk with uh, Rip, Rip, Ripley. Okay, I will add uh, you to the room. And Aquatic. Uh, one moment, sorry, I didn't do it in the right way. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, now you will be joining Ripple. Okay, the rest, guys, uh, I mean, uh, some of the projects still got investors' interest, but we didn't uh, do all the rooms like Mindset Technologies and Dead Shed. You have a certain interest from one of the investors. So we will introduce you uh, separately and individually to those investors, okay? Uh, so for the moment, any investor, any other investor who wants to... Um, join also david there is one um investor interested in your project we will introduce you separately because there's only one okay and he's interested in other project as well okay uh okay. thank you if, thank you if any of the investors are left that are not assigned to the rooms let me know that want to hear to any projects or if you guys want to, to hear to the pitching to the investors questions, let me know just for learning purposes, I can, I can uh, assign you to any room just to listen if you want. That would be really, uh, really welcome. Uh, Elena, if that would be possible at least for me. Okay, where do you want to go? I would, uh, I would, I would, um, I would try to assign you to smart. Okay, I will do it. Anyone else wants to join any rooms? If yeah, not, could you put me in anyone? Who is this? Nikhil. Nikhil. Are, are you a project or are you an investor? Investor. Okay, which uh, project did you like out of those? I missed the, the presentation, so... Okay, I will put you to vector. Okay. Same here. Ashley, where do you want to go? Is it Ashley, where do you want, or oh, Catherine? Just let me know uh, which um, I did not get the spreadsheet, so just, uh, I don't know. Um, I forgot. Just, uh, I guess, throw me in a, in a room and then we'll just go from there. Okay, good. I will put you to solidarity. Okay, Catherine, do you want any, any? Okay, I'll, I'll just.
Okay, Elena, I'll drop off. Um, you... Okay, Aladar, there is one investor who is interested in you, Charles McConick. I will introduce you, uh, yeah, separately, okay? Via, via email. Yeah, via email, because there is only one and just for the moment is too complicated. Or you can wait okay. if you want, maybe he asks. Uh, Charles McConnell. If you if you want, you can wait for him. He's with jail brain now. Okay. If he Charles. Ah uh, no, he's is uh, with shield. He uh, wants to come back. So feel free to tell him to to get back once he once he um, is done. Yeah. Ash Ashley, do you want to move? I sent you an invite and you didn't join. Do, do, do you see the invite on your screen? Ashley? 